if you eliminate green hydrogen, we're going to, personally, I start talking about the extinction because it is, it is the key item to maintain what I believe uh, is key attributes of our civilization. Welcome to Facing Future. Joining me today are Patrick Hogan, NASA Earth Scientist Emeritus and former program manager for NASA World Wind, the precursor to Google Earth. Also with us today is John Gentile, the managing director of Cascadia Energy Technologies. Welcome to you both. Thank you. It's happy to have you be here with you and Patrick. John asked us for the opportunity to present the case for green hydrogen specifically a compact, highly efficient electrolyzer module, which can be employed locally at very small scale almost anywhere, like in this remote village in Malaysia. Now, this system can be scaled up for applications such as air travel or for powering large trucks where weight and energy density are crucial factors. Green hydrogen made by the electrolysis of water is considered green if the energy used to produce it comes from renewable sources. Environmentally, it's a significant improvement over the black, gray, and blue hydrogen widely used today, all of whose production relies on coal or methane. So with this and other technologies at our disposal, is a paradigm shift possible in the very limited time we have left to mitigate the worst effects of climate breakdown. What do you think? Yeah, we say absolutely, but we need a new, uh, we need a new paradigm, it's our view. So our paradigm is infinite oil. We just keep on spending it or using it as if it was going to be there forever, and yet it's a limited supply. It's uh, also uh, doing some damage to our atmosphere with, um, with the waste product of our current coal use and oil use. So the things that you are going to be talking about, John, are quite a big deal today in terms of Earth getting to a safer place. Well, thank you, Patrick. I, we, we, take, we take the responsibility in that way. Uh, we have a little tiny part to play, but we have, uh, you know, my background, some of my partners, we have a view into it that, that gave us a certain way to we think to proceed and might be helpful. And energy density is just a basic. We use oil, uh, we use gasoline, we use diesel because of the energy density and other features in terms of uh, you know being able to transport at atmospheric uh, temperatures and pressures and other other attributes. But without the energy density, uh, we would leave <laughs> fossil fuels far in the past. Well, I guess you know it brings us to the larger question, which is that the tipping points on the Earth this this July and August we already crossed one point five, um, which was you know the magic number. And we know that you know Greenland is melting as well, and serious permafrost leaks and the methane from those are are very serious. There's a very big question as to whether we do have any possibility of stopping the, the mechanisms that are already in place as the climate system has lagged to get uh, really cooking from all the uh, greenhouse gases we've already put in the air. Uh, so it's a question of really racing against time. You know, I'll tell you right now, if you eliminate green hydrogen, we're going to personally, I start talking about the extinction. Because it is the key item to maintain what I believe uh, is key attributes of our civilization. Okay, we're going to go through a transition. There's just no, in our minds, no question. We don't argue that point with the, those who speak about it. Patrick, what do you think about that? Have you look, um, you've looked into this a little bit? Yeah, I'm. I'm curious at uh, at what the obstacles are in terms of the technology, this green hydrogen technology, um, what the obstacles are technologically speaking, which of course is gonna get into some of the storage issue, not just yeah. production, but the storage and distribution you know, issues. Um, but not only, what are the technical obstacles that you are dealing with technically? And then the other part is socially, what's, what do you see as the obstacle? And I'll imagine that's called financing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It comes down to that. Absolutely. 
Well, I think you go to the second item that we went to, frankly, uh, because as you look at energy density, and particularly as you look at uh, green hydrogen, uh, you know, that has to be made. If it's going to be green hydrogen, uh, you need to have a primary source uh, to, to, to store or to crack it, et cetera, that is itself green. But those are intermittent. They're by their nature, they're intermittent, except for uh, hydro or if you include nuclear. But typically, certainly wind and, uh, and solar, uh, as we all would agree, are intermittent. So we come to storage. Now, we're talking about two aspects, critically, capacity and discharge. And that chart really lays it out very clearly, you know, in our minds, what would it take to replace a certain amount of liquid fuels in a particular circumstance? What, what does it really take? And I'll, I'll refer in that respect to Nate Hagen's, by the way. Uh, somebody, I don't know if you, are you guys familiar with Nate Hagen's work at all? And, yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Nate, Nate brings up, uh, I'll just mention briefly, an, an energy blindness, okay? And it, it, the, the, really, the amount of energy is required to do a particular job, okay? And going back to Patrick's earlier point, we use a lot of oil because of the energy density and the energy required to do much of what we do in our civilized world. And even in some transition, in our view, you're still going to have to account for it. Now, hopefully you can account for that energy requirement in, in a way that's very green and just continues hurting the, hurting the biosphere and, and, and other individuals. But uh, if you're going to do that, you really look at something that can store a lot of energy. It's, it's the capacity factor. And then at a discharge basis, can discharge enough energy to get the work done. The other thing that does for you in terms of the key aspect that you mentioned, Patrick, and it comes out of finance, is that, you, that, that now uh, mass manufacturing is available to you. The world's quite good at manufacturing. Well, Park Avenue in New York in 1900 was all horses and buggies. And in 1913, you can only find one horse and buggy on that whole avenue in New York. They're all automobiles. Now, my other message this morning is... <laughs> You know, Henry Ford didn't, didn't you know, change the world with the automobile. He changed the world by changing the way we produce mobility. Okay. Um, he, he fundamentally produced that mobility at a rate, uh, at a financial and social, uh, what do you want to say, foundation that a lot of people could use it, right? And wanted to use it, and wanted to use it, of course. I mean, so you made car affordable. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And what we're really talking about with some of the technologies now is, is just that. We can, we can shut the recording off, basically. We're getting to the point. We're not quite there, but really, we're right there looking. You know, we're, we're sneaking up over the edge. We're, we can see it. We can see the full bit. People like my you know, engineering partners, they can see it, and it's happening. You know, it's happening in Europe right now, in our, in our mind. So uh, it's affordable, it's doable, that's small scale, and that's the paradigm shift. Will we be able to make the paradigm shift because for us to get there, it sounds like there's going to have to be a, a mental uh, a shift as well in society because we're going to have to agree that, look, if we want a livable environment, we're going to have to put a lot more energy, money, into this clean technology uh, yeah. for energy. And that paradigm sh uh, shift on the social level is not an easy one. It, it hasn't been. I really agree with you. And Patrick, my response to you is this. We're using the fossil fuel paradigm to produce energy. What's worse, I mean, what, what the real problem is, we're using that to produce renewable energy. And it's, it's, it's an absolute failure. You know what? People are pretty smart. Just like those people that said, you know, the horse is great, but boy, it leaves, it leaves de debris all over the place. And uh, boy, these cars are kind of nice. When, and I think we all are ready for a real change. The centralized, you know, the, the gathering a massive material, whether that be crude oil or, or cobalt or lithium, gathering a mass from around the world bringing it to a central place to process, okay, and, and driving the cost down that way, okay, and, and quotes driving them down, uh, you know, if, if, if that's your only paradigm, I think we're seeing the result of that. 
And people have had enough of it. And, you know, people don't see a real change there. What we're suggesting is a, dis- a truly distributed paradigm for energy, a way of producing energy. And they're, they're, the, two need, the two need not be in conflict with one another. Okay, so the big hubs. That the, right now, that central yeah. processing is mostly in China. And uh, the Chinese economy is 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 going down uh, today. Uh, what is it Paul Krugman suggesting that uh, the Chinese need to consume more in order to boost their economy? Um, that that would somehow be a solution. You know? So this kind of shift of paradigm uh, is is kind of insane. I mean, what we really need to shift away is from our whole consumer concept that consumption is life and, and buying things is what life is about. Um, e- even if we shift to uh, renewables, um, we're doing a hell of a lot of damage to the environment by mining and other processes. We need less, less, less. You know, we need to stop, stop, stop. And um, I can't. I mean, that's the paradigm shift that I see is 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 to simplify our lives in, in in the United States and in Europe, where we consume so much energy. There's, I don't see any way through um, not changing our our agricultural paradigm. For example, or, you know, continuing to have industrial cow operations. <laughs> It's just so ridiculously harmful to the soils and to the sequestration of uh, carbon that has to occur by restoring nature. So it's not just technology. It's also a, a shift in our ethical understanding of what is our relationship to nature and to to each other, really. Well, well again, that's really the big picture that you're talking about. But the problem is profit is our true God. And until we find a way to make this green technology at least overwhelmingly appreciated by thinking about the goodness of it, or we make it cheap, <laughs> so or well, both at the same time. The, the the latter the latter is where we go. And Dale, please understand what you just described is the old paradigm. We're using the old paradigm. China China controls the solar. We haven't even started to make that change. We, when we make the change, and we're, we're making it now, we, we're, our little company is playing one little role, and there's many companies, many people around the world who are working on this. And then it gets at what Patrick has mentioned. It becomes affordable. It's already attractive. I can't tell you. Let me say it this way, Patrick. We really want to look at energy return value and the carbon return. How much? Both. For example, it's something like 50 kilowatts for, for one kilogram of hydrogen with an electrolysis system. It's a lot of high, you know, it's, a, it's an energy intensive process. But again, what's that for? What's it replacing? You know, uh, how much carbon are you using in that, in that whole process? The all in carbon and energy costs we like to look at for everything. And it's going to take a different way of looking at, at, at the world, if you will. Big hydrogen requires a huge amount of energy, right? So, you know, and, and particularly to, to, to transport it. So I'll come to another uh, predicate of ours. We go to the other end. We want to do it locally. We want to do it locally because that cuts out a huge amount of the, of the cost and, and carbon costs of, uh, of the hydrogen. Well, John, we really appreciate your coming today and, and shedding some light on this uh, issue of green hydrogen. Um, you know, there is no free lunch when it comes to energy. There, there's always some costs. Uh, even the renewable renewable energies, you know, are extractive and destructive. But the shift of paradigm that's critical to our possible survival is also an ethical question and a political question. And there's a whole larger conversation as to whether we have the willpower to make it happen. Um, And we all hope we do, but uh, we are naturally quite skeptical um, about it. And we do appreciate your your efforts and and your enthusiasm for change. Thank you, thank you. Using using the, the fossil fuel paradigm for renewables, we believe is what's been done, and that's why we're failing. So, go local. Good point. Okay, well, thank you very much, both of you, for being on Facing Future today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.